The 2016 Florida legislative session was in stark contrast from last year, and it was more, I, I should say, less controversial and much more collaborative. Lawmakers overwhelmingly passed the largest budget in the Sunshine State's history. Tonight, we'll discuss the winners and losers with the local members of the Northwest Florida legislative delegation. We are live and interactive on radio and on television. From the Phyllis and Mike Johnson studio, Legislative Review Dialogue with a Delegation is straight ahead. This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Jeff Weeks. Thank you so very much for joining us. In addition to our television broadcast on WSRE TV, we're also being heard on News Radio 1620. Our goal tonight is to analyze the 2016 Florida legislative session. In doing so, we want the input from you, our constituents of Northwest Florida. This is a forum to ask you the uh, for you to ask the legislators questions about issues that most concern or interest you. You can do so by email or phone. The email address is questions at WSRE.org or if you prefer, you can call us at 850-484-1223 or toll free at 1-800-239-WSRE. Due to term limits and a changing political landscape, this is probably the last time we'll have this group of legislators together representing the Northwest Florida delegation. Unfortunately, two of our, or I should say our two senators, Don Gates and Greg Evers, were unable to join us this evening. However, we are joined by our four House representatives. Representative from District 1 is Clay Ingram. Representative Ingram chairs the Transportation and Economic Development Appropriations Subcommittee. From District 2, Representative Mike Hill. Representative Hill is the Vice Chair of the Civil Justice Subcommittee. And from District 3, Doug Broxson. Representative Broxson sits on the Local and Federal Affairs Committee. And from District 4, Representative Matt Gates. He is the Chair of the Finance and Tax Committee. Uh, gentlemen, welcome and thank you so very much for joining us. I apologize for stumbling a little bit here around, but I'm having a difficult time <laughs> seeing what's in front of me. Maybe, maybe I need more than just readers for glasses. Anyhow, uh, gentlemen, let me uh, begin by asking you this question. Last year, the, the session was rather controversial, and as I mentioned in the open, it was a lot more collegial this year. Uh, Representative Ingram, I'll begin with you. Why is that? Sure. Well, you know, first of all, it does feel good to have gone to Tallahassee, done our business, uh, you know, the way we intended to do it, pass the budget, done the things we're constitutionally required to do, and be back home. And so that, that it, it feels like we, we uh, you know, got the job done, and that's great. But, uh, you, you know, t taking some of the very controversial things off the table, uh, you know, it was said during the, the summer and leading up to session that, you know, Medicaid expansion was not going to be on the table. So taking that very hot button issue off the, the table, the, the Senate made that clear, uh, that, that opened the door and paved the way for us to be able to have a a session to focus on the things that we weren't able to get done last year, namely, you know, getting the budget passed uh, and then passing some good, uh, you know, policy-oriented uh, 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 legislation. And so, um, I think taking the, the biggest hot button issue off the table just just made it a lot easier to get the job done. Representative Hill, your thoughts? Oh, I agree completely with Representative Ingram. What we have shown is that conservative principles work when it comes to governing the state of Florida. Florida has become the destination state in the nation. It's because of the conservative principles that have been used by everyone here in this delegation of limited government, low taxes, personal freedom, and individual responsibility. It has created an environment where businesses are moving here. People are moving here at a, a rate of a thousand a day. Um, Governor Scott has done a tremendous job creating an environment since 2010. Over a million jobs have been created in Florida. So it's because of conservative legislature and wanting to use those conservative principles. We've made Florida the destination state in our nation. Representative Broxson? Well, some people would say we were just exhausted from 2015. <laughs> we were there over 106 days and uh, a lot of committee weeks. But there was two issues, and I think Clay mentioned that Medicaid expansion was a big issue, and we chose not to bite in the, in the House because of the future ramifications that would have on our budget. 43% of our budget now is healthcare related. 
43 mm. percent out of every dollar we spend on health care. And if it goes much farther, we're going to see a disintegration of education and roads and all the things that make Florida such a great place to live. And secondly, we had a very contentious president of the Senate race that created an overtone that was resolved early. So it was a much better session, and I think we had a much better time during the session. Representative Gates. Well, thanks, Jeff, and thank you to WSRE and to Pensacola State College for having us tonight. I think one of the reasons why the politicians in Florida did their job better this year is because the people of Florida did better this last year. You know, yet again, we have another year with an improving economy in the state of Florida. Every person on the show tonight was elected in 2010. In that time, we had a $6 billion budget shortfall. Unemployment was approaching 12%. Now it's half that. The budget shortfall, now a surplus. We had over 30,000 regulations on the books. We repealed or replaced over 4,000 of them. And the legislature prior to our election that had voted for tax increases was gone. And we have cut taxes over 50 times since each of us were elected. So when the people of Florida have the space to go be successful without the overreach of government, then I think the pressure is off to be able to just let the great folks in, in the state of Florida thrive. Okay, wonderful. Well, uh, nice uh, synopsis here. And we have a ton of questions tonight. We have had some tremendous response from our viewers and constituents and listeners, and we greatly appreciate that. And again, if you would like to get a question in, you can do so by calling 850-484-1223 or toll free at 1-800-239-WSRE or email questions at WSRE.org. So let's begin with our questions, and these are from our viewers and listeners. We'll begin with raises for state employees. The question is, why did neither the Senate nor the House budget include a raise for state employees who have received one raise in the past 10 years and are now contributing 3% to the Florida retirement system. So who wants to take that one? Well, some employees got raises, Jeff, and they're members of our delegation who voted against it, and they were the elected officials, the politicians. There was a bill that was passed by the Florida House, passed by the Senate. I voted against it, and others here did as well, that gave supervisors of elections a $20,000 pay raise. And the reason I voted no against that bill is because I know the lady who works at the health department as a nurse. You know, I know the, the firefighters who go out and protect us from wildfires. And if the blue collar workers for our state, the people who are on the front lines can't get raises, then I stood up and debated against giving pay raises to any politicians because we ought to lead by example and make sure that we stand up for the people who really provide the, the great service in this state. Uh, I think that you know, in good economic times, there ought to be an opportunity to reward people who've worked for us. During our tenure in the legislature, there was uh, a modest pay raise for state workers, but uh, growing government doesn't seem to be uh, in, in vogue with a lot of our constituents, uh, but certainly we ought to do better at recognizing the great contributions of our state workers. Anyone else like to add to that? We also killed up, uh, there was a measure put forth to uh, increase the salaries of legislators also. We, that was. Uh, uh, killed pretty pretty uh, handily, wouldn't, and rightly so. Anybody want to add to the on the, on the state worker issue? Uh, okay. So the next question comes from one of our viewers, and it has to do with veterans and PTSD medical marijuana. Why were veterans with PTSD excluded from the medical marijuana bill passed this year? Um, <laughs> Matt, I know you're kind of a, that's kind of your wheelhouse, so. Uh, <clears throat> The, the marijuana issues so yeah Jeff only means that for the listening audience <laughs> yeah. because I sponsor the bills That's there's right. no other way in which he's referencing <laughs> no, marijuana not, being I mean, in my wheelhouse you, you, but you, you yeah I mean look it should have been Jeff I mean honestly uh, every one of us serve veterans and we hear the stories about how bad the VA is how hard it is to get basic medical care because the federal government has a system of treating veterans that is completely broken I would have supported medical cannabis use for veterans with PTSD Unfortunately, that measure died in the Florida Senate, not in the Florida House. And there, the circumstance that we were faced with was some believed that there could have been overdiagnosis for PTSD for veterans. That's not a view I hold. I think we should have done it, and it's unfortunate that that died in the Senate. Any, anyone else like to add to that? Phil? 
Okay, we'll go on to our next question. It has to do with a drinking water safety from one of our viewers. And um, she says, we've been hearing an awful lot lately about uh, lead in drinking water. Uh, of course, the, the Michigan situation comes to mind. She says, the city of Jay has just gotten a grant to filter pesticides from their drinking water. In addition to flood protection, the water management district's job is to protect, maintain, and improve the quality of water. They've had crippling cuts to their budgets. And the viewer is asking, which of you will work to restore funding to to the water management districts during the next session. Well, well Jeff, the, this past session, part of the budget was over $205 million to a dedicated source of funding just to make sure that we have good water here in Florida, from our Everglades all the way up to our springs and, and rivers up here in a panhandle. So we are addressing that issue. It's something that was important to the constituents, um, <clears throat> evidenced by the passing of an amendment to our Constitution. And we are tackling that problem and being serious about it. Jeff, we are the envy of the state as far as water. We have the best aquifers and we have the best clean water. Uh, there are anecdotal situations because we have some older cities that have long uh, needed uh, revamp of their systems. And hopefully we can get to that in future years just as we did with Jay. But we're the envy of the state as far as water. Uh, we have it. People are going to need it in the future, and that's the reason we're going to be able to grow constructively and responsibly over the next few years. All right. We'll move on to our next question. Expanding Medicaid. Florida has refused the federal monies to expand Medicaid, making affordable health care unaffordable for the middle class. My husband has a job, or I should say had a job change recently, and uh, since we are dancing on the line, she says, uh, on salary allowances to receive the tax credit, we have uh, chosen to take COBRA as our insurance to the sum of $1,200 per month. What health insurance do our representatives have and what are your premiums? Well, I think the real question is, is she's trying to say, what's the solution for me? Jeff, I'll, I'll tell you this, and that, that's why uh, questions like that uh, tend to bother me, is that, uh, you know, I look at uh, my employees and, and look at the uh, uh, skyrocketing uh, rates that they have to pay, you know, uh, you know, 20 percent uh, every year, you know, since then that, that's a conservative estimate, you know, since the passage of Obamacare. And uh, to think that that would get any better for anyone uh, if we were to expand Medicaid in the state of Florida is, is a fallacy and it would uh, it, it's, it's gotten worse for a lot of people and I don't think that expanding the Medicaid system in Florida, a broken system, uh, would improve uh, the lot for anyone. Now, expanding Medicaid was a non-starter for me when we learned that from the Obama administration they were going to pick who that expanding uh, field was going to be and it included able working, uh, able-bodied uh, working adults when we currently have on a waiting list those who are blind and disabled that Medicaid was truly intended for. And when we asked the question, can we expand it to this population first, and was told no, that instead we have to expand it to these able-bodied adults, that was a non-starter for me right there, not to even mention the expense that it would be. As Representative Broxson said, health care is already 43% of our total budget have expanded that Medicaid would have just made a cost prohibitive. And you know, Jeff, I want to speak directly to the viewer's question about all of us and the health care we receive. And here's the truth. We receive world-class health care. We've got amazing coverage and we only pay eight dollars a month. I think that's outrageous. That's why I filed a bill to put every politician in Florida on Medicaid. Because if there's a health care delivery product that's good enough for the poorest and most vulnerable people in this state, it ought to be good enough for the politicians in this state. Unfortunately, I couldn't even get a hearing to get a vote on that bill in the, in the health care subcommittee it was referred to. And I think that's a sad commentary on a system that places politicians above the people we serve. It should be the other way around. Now, as for expanding Medicaid, expanding Medicaid would do very little to help the listener that sent that question. In California, the day before they expanded Medicaid, they had 8 million people on their Medicaid product. Three years later, they had 12 million people on their Medicaid product. One in every three Californians is on Medicaid today. You can't raise taxes enough to accommodate that need. So they cut rates to providers. Providers left the system. And now if you want to get primary care in California, you have to wait many, many months while your medical condition abscesses. What we've done to provide better health care is to cut cost. You know, there are people like nurse practitioners and physician's assistants who can do more to help patients and drive down the cost of health care. 
So while the Obama administration is focused on coverage that is often illusory, we actually want to make health care more accessible and affordable for everybody. Okay. Anyone else like to add to that? You're watching a Legislative Review here on WSRE Television. We're also being simulcast on News Radio 1620, and you can call us at 850-484-1223 and ask your question off the air. We would certainly love to hear from you. A great response this evening from our viewers, listeners, and constituents. We appreciate all the input. Here's our next question from one of our uh, viewers. Why are we, the state of Florida, uh, at the next to last in funding for mental health services given there is uh, such fervor over the right to bear arms? And let me, I, I think where the viewer may have been going with that is there's been uh, many of the shootings, it's come back to the fact that the person had uh, some sort of mental instability. So, good question. Yeah, and, and I think the legislature acted appropriately and in a bipartisan fashion when we took measures to make sure that people who were released for mental health facilities who had been institutionalized then wouldn't walk right out and have access to firearms. You know, there, there are good, sound public policy reasons to make sure that we have good gun laws and that we have good mental health laws, and I think we're striking a good balance. We have taken a number of steps to help specific populations in mental health. I'm very pleased that we all work together to make sure that Escambia County can stand up a veterans court so that veterans who come back with particular mental health challenges will be treated in a way that gives great dignity to their service while also acknowledging the serious consequences that come from interacting with the criminal justice system. So I think we're having a targeted approach to mental health. I think, frankly, the way that we pr provision mental health care in the state is very efficient. And I think we need to do more to make sure that family members are more included and have more choice to see where their loved ones are getting mental health care rather than being shoehorned into a state system that too often is failing. Anyone else like to add? All right, we'll move on to our next question. Uh, viewer says, I just want to say thank you to the legislature slash governor for the new guidelines for forfeiture, uh, forfeiture funds. Oh, yeah. So, anyone want to comment on that? In, in regard to life insurance proceeds? I'm not sure. Um, says, <laughs> historically, when they, there was not a matching up of the death roll, and now we've said to the insurance companies that they've got to go back uh, 25 years, true up who has died according to the Social Security list, and send those benefits to the people that are the beneficiaries. If they can't find them, then that's going to go directly to the fund that we have, the unclaimed property fund in the state, and we will make the effort to find it. I was, I was going to add an amendment, and I've got an agreement that we will add an amendment uh, to the bill, to the CFO's bill next year, that says we'll take 10% of those funds and find the people that that money belongs to. The state certainly shouldn't be keeping it. So we have to make an effort to get it back to the people it belongs to. Okay. And a quick plug, Jeff, while we have the, the chance, and, and we know people are interested in the subject, uh, there are uh, close to a billion dollars in assets that the CFO uh, keeps on behalf of people that the state hasn't been able to track down with regard to uh, lost property. It could be something as uh, simple as an, uh, a refund check from the uh, Department of Revenue or, or, or something like that. So uh, you can do a quick Google search. I think it's floridatreasurehunt.com, but a quick Google search will find that. And, people may have money that the state's holding on their behalf that, that they is, they're entitled to. Okay, very well. Uh, another viewer question, what was done to improve the conditions, um, I, I believe for the senior developmentally, developmentally disabled folks, uh, especially those living in group homes? Was anything done this year in the legislature that may have? There, there are a number of facilities that care for the elderly that interact with the state from a regulatory standpoint and we had some very bad consequences, not in Northwest Florida, but in other parts of the state where ALFs, uh, assisted living facilities, had mistreated people. And so we made sure to uh, have regulations in place so that those who were part of the greatest generation that were taking care of in many of these facilities uh, can live out their, their final days and months uh, in, in dignity and without uh, abusive conditions being present. So we took action. I believe that was in the last legislative session, not this most recent one. And we're waiting to see how those reforms improve quality of life going forward. Okay. Um, viewer wants to know, when will we begin to improve bike transportation in Florida? So I guess more bike paths. Yeah, Jeff, uh, and this, this was a uh, sort of a, a, a project or a, a passion of the uh, outgoing Senate president was a Florida trail system. There is obviously some resistance to that with regard to uh, uh, questioning whether or not it was frivolous funding. 
uh, but it's something that he was able to push through. And so there's a creation of a Florida a trail network throughout the state of Florida that's been funded. And uh, you know, I would think eventually, uh, you know, probably uh, Central Florida heavy because that was the, uh, the district of the Senate president. But I think that we'll start to see those trails proliferate even in uh, the Panhandle. Of course, we have a wonderful trail up in, uh, in Milton there. So. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Um, anyway, uh, moving on with a transportation question, when will we begin to improve rail transportation? So that's something that's kind of been a hot button yeah. issue over the years. So, you know, uh, I think we all know that uh, using Amtrak as an example, that rail in and of itself does not uh, self-sustain. It has to be subsidized. And so there's a, a new model uh, uh, that uh, is, is, has been introduced in the state of Florida that uh, uh, takes uh, assets like real estate at the train stations uh, to create mixed-use facilities at the train stations where you can have some residential uh, apartments, uh, restaurants in the, on the bottom floors, and uh, actually takes those train stations and makes them an asset that produces revenue that makes the, uh, it takes the burden off of the uh, passenger you know, fees to pay for the fact that the train exists. And so as uh, those ideas start to become reality, I think it makes uh, rail in the state of Florida uh, possible and doable, and we'll probably see more of it. Uh, just, you know, the, the old system lost money, uh, mm -hmm. had to be so heavily subsidized that it was uh, it just eventually went away. Okay. Uh, Jeff, I had the pleasure of being in the airport, the Orlando airport, and met the CEO of a company that is right now developing a railway from uh, Orlando down to Miami, and it's not with government money. That's the way it needs to be done. It needs to be done with a private venture who is able to do it efficiently, and as uh, Representative Ingram said, they are at each of the stops. They're making it multi-use. Um, they're taking a blighted area down in Miami and are going to turn it into a fabulous facility. It's private sector work. They do it better. They do it more efficiently, and that's what we should be relying on. Okay, very good. Let's move on to another viewer question. Uh, viewer says, recently uh, SB 668 alimony reform was passed by a wide majority in both the Florida House and Senate. So far, this bill has not made it to the governor's desk for his approval or veto. He did veto a similar bill in 2013 after a majority of both the House and Senate approved the bill that year. Um, the viewer says, certainly to the uh, untrained in the legislative process, this looks suspicious and like some political maneuvering uh, behind closed doors. So he basically wants to know, uh, is that the case? And please enlighten us as to what happens after the bill is approved by the Senate and the timeline for the governor to approve veto or take no action. Well, Jeff, uh, that sounds like a very well-informed viewer on the matter of alimony, who is undoubtedly asking for a friend, I'm sure. Uh, the House and Senate have the opportunity at the conclusion of legislative session to either hold bills for a limited period of time or to send them directly to the governor. Here, because Governor Scott r vetoed the last version of alimony reform, I believe the legislature has held that bill for the maximum allowable amount of time so that the governor could hear from a number of the stakeholders prior to making that decision. So it is a tool that the legislature enjoys so that if we feel as though the governor needs more input or more of an opportunity to review a very complex matter like alimony, that that time will exist. But there is a time certain in which we will send the governor the bill and then the clock will begin ticking for him to take action on that bill. As uh, someone who has been supportive of alimony reform, I sure hope that he signs the bill this time. Okay. Anyone else? I would add to that, Jeff, that uh, it's not the same bill that the governor vetoed before. Um, there were some tweaks that were done with it. There was discussion with the governor's office to make sure it would be more palatable to him this time. And I think it's a very good bill. It sets a very fair uh, 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 formulas for how alimony is going to be paid and also some timelines on there. So I thought it was a good piece of legislation. Okay, very good. Anyone else like to add to that? All righty. Uh, viewer question about Planned Parenthood. With the defunding of Planned Parenthood, what are your ideas for meeting the needs and services they provide to the citizenry that no longer are available? Jeff, I'd like to address that because that was an overall bill. It was a large bill that had to do with protecting women's health and also protecting the unborn. The part where it's of defunding Planned Parenthood was not defunding Planned Parenthood uh, for uh, anything other than abortions. And Planned Parenthood wasn't the only organization that was uh, signaled out. 
It was anyone who performs an abortion in the state of Florida just says taxpayers will not pay for that abortion. All other things that Planned Parenthood or those other clinics do, um, they can still receive funding for that, just not for abortion. That was one part of the that overall bill, which I thought was an excellent bill. The governor signed it uh, last week. It also says that if a doctor is going to perform that procedure of an abortion, they must have admitting privileges or a transfer agreement with a hospital that's within a reasonable proximity. It also said that ACA was going to have to inspect the facilities that perform these abortions and make sure that they are meeting the same requirements of any other ambulatory surgical center, uh, which again is protecting the women's health. And then finally that bill says that uh, it will be completely illegal to sell uh, the body parts of an aborted baby. So it did not just signal out Planned Parenthood, what it did was said that for any clinic that provides an abortion, we will not pay, taxpayers will not pay for that abortion. And the question Jeff also went to, well, you know, is there some vacuum that we've left? where people aren't getting care. And I'm proud to say that each member of this delegation stood up and we increased funding for low-income women to be able to get mammograms and to be able to get cervical cancer screenings through the Mary Brogan program. We provided more funding for that program than had been provided before. And so we're taking the measures to make sure that where there are truly critical women's health issues that we need to address, like mammograms, like cervical cancer screening, that we're making sure that's available for everybody. Okay, very good. We want to remind everyone that they can call in with a question or email a question. You can email to questions at wsre.org. And for our radio listeners, give us a call at 850-484-1223 or toll free at 1-800-239-WSRE. Our legislative review dialogue with the delegation is not only being seen over the airwaves of WSRE television, but we're also being broadcast on News Radio 1620. Greatly appreciate you listening and your involvement this evening. Um, a gentlemen, a question from a viewer and listener. Why has nothing been done to change the way owners of timeshares are treated? If a timeshare owner quits paying their fees, they can be sued by the timeshare when it should be a foreclosure, uh, according to the viewer. And the ownership goes back to the timeshare company. The current system in this viewer's judgment is very unfair and regulations need to be adopted to fix it. Comments, thoughts? Yeah, this is sort of a question as to who is the least cost avoider. If there is a challenge in timeshare transactions, is it the role of government to step in and tell people how they can or how they must contract with one another? Or should it be more incumbent upon the individual to thoroughly review the timeshare agreement and the real estate contract? I think most of the folks that serve our delegation fall in the category of personal responsibility, not government or social responsibility on that question. Okay. Representative Ingram and Gates, why are you in favor of Common Core? Well, I'm not. Are you Representative Ingram? No, that's a funny question. No. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, actually, Jeff, so I, that answers that yeah, question. I sponsored legislation to make sure that our local school districts can opt out of Common Core textbooks. Prior to that legislation, a school district had to pick their instructional materials off of a state approved list, which meant they were all Common Core materials. And so uh, I'm very pleased that my colleagues in our delegation, our legislature and our governor all agreed. And now every local school district has the right to choose their own materials and depart from the Common Core materials. Let me ask a broad question here. How did education fare in this session? Yeah. I would say, that, you know, especially K, K through 12 education uh, is a, a banner funding year, you know, Representative Gates and, and uh, Senator Gates uh, have championed uh, increasing the FEFP uh, formula to the school districts and so um, you know from a strict funding standpoint they, the, the K-12 education did pretty well and I think that most of the, the university and, and state college systems did well too. Uh, I know Pensacola State uh, was a, a recipient of uh, PICO funding for uh, building construction that's going to be very important not just uh, you know educationally or to the school but to the community at large. I know the, the building that specifically is going to be built uh, will help with uh, VT Aerospace's uh, expansion here in Pensacola and help train folks that will work at that, that uh, facility at the airport. So uh, overall, did, did very well in education. And I would agree, Jeff. Um, education was the second largest portion of our budget, uh, being funded at $22 billion, and the per pupil student funding was the highest in our history at $7,178 per student. 
And as Representative Ingram had mentioned, uh, we re uh, received funding for the, the PICO funding for Pensacola State College as well as University of West Florida. I thought education did very well this year. Okay. We continue to tweak the system. We want a performance. When you're spending over $7,000 per pupil, then we're asking for accountability. And frankly, there are many areas of the state. Fortunately, my county and Okaloosa County and is not one of those counties, but some of these counties historically underperform. And we're sending a strong message that if you do not perform at a level that gets people uh, uh, in a position to have a job that, that makes them a reasonable income, then we're gonna let them have other options, charter schools and other forms of, of uh, options. So we're gonna continue as we have for the last several years to increase our budget for education, but we're gonna increase our uh, we're going to ask people in every county to make sure that they're spending that money wisely. And Jeff, a question I get a lot in Santa Rosa County is this. You know, each and every year, the students and parents and teachers in Santa Rosa County are one of the highest performing school districts in the state, but yet they get the lowest per pupil funding in the state. And that's not fair. It's simply not. I mean, if, we're, if what we're doing is paying for performance, we ought to be doing a lot more in education funding, particularly in Santa Rosa County. Now, one thing I hear about from parents is not about funding, but it's about testing. And I'm hearing more and more from parents and students and grandparents that when we just set up a long string of high stakes tests throughout the year and we're, all we're doing is preparing for the next test, we lose the chance for innovative pedagogy that all of us remember as critical to our educational success. So we teamed up and we made sure that we passed legislation that would restrict the assessment time to no more than 5% of the seat time for the student. And I think then we'll get better validity in our assessments if we're not doing them so frequently and not just simply signing up for every high stakes test under the sun. Right. And obviously we don't have control over what the districts do at the state level or the federal government does or uh, testing, college interest testing, things like that. Uh, but I think we should take a, a step back because of some of the funding, the, the fact that we put, uh, you know, K-12 funding uh, at a, uh, made it a priority, uh, and then the hard work by the, the you know, local school districts, uh, I think that uh, the end result or the fruit of what is produced uh, is pretty tremendous. I mean, I think that the, the biggest uh, evidence is, uh, you know, Superintendent Thomas and, and the school district and all the teachers and principals and uh, uh, workers in the schools, the graduation rate in Escambia County, pretty tremendous uh, uptick in graduation rate that I think everyone should be proud of and I think it's a culmination of all of that uh, hard work and, and funding and effort that's that's gone into it so it's working I think we all we just need to recognize the fact that it's producing uh, fruit okay very good uh, another viewer question regarding ad valorem taxation of leasehold property um, viewer says so we are towards the end of a multi-year era of judicial ambivalence which without legislative or executive redress uh, and uh, contrary to existing law has me paying ad valorem taxes and municipal service benefit units because I own three, eight, well, I'm not going to say where he is, but anyway, um, he, he says, what is being done to undo this embarrassing government confusion, which is at least uh, unconscionable, if not purposeful means of scaring potential visitors, residents and businesses away? Well, that's been a hot button topic for quite a few years now. So <laughs> who wants to address that? Well, whether it's good news or bad news, there's part of that that's pretty much been settled, and that's the lease, the, the land itself. Uh, there was a ruling in the last two weeks where the improvements on that land should not be subject to ad valorem tax, and I think that's fair. Uh, there's a lot of confusion. People that came down at vault condos on the beach were told there would never be any ad valorem tax. Uh, the county sued both Santa Rosa and Escambia, and one in all the way up to the Florida Supreme Court. Many people are very upset about that because that's an expense that they never anticipated. But we do have good news for them, and that is their improvements. It appears to us that that will maybe stand uh, the, the court test, and they will not have to pay that, that additional tax. Okay. 
Good. Uh, here's something regarding the Pensacola Bay Bridge. The Florida State Transportation Board is well aware of the problems in Gulf Breeze at rush hours and also on weekends uh, at uh, the beach for the various events that go on there with uh, traffic backing up and, and going through the uh, area on Highway 98 using just four lanes that are present. Uh, yet they seem to think that they can expand the bridge uh, and highway through Gulf Breeze to six lanes with additional traffic increasing over the years and not having the same problem they have right now. Uh, makes a couple of comments, you know, <laughs> that I won't won't share there. But anyway, I guess the question is, um, what's being done about this? Are, are they taking a serious look at this situation and considering all the options? I, yeah, well, let me uh, address the question like this uh, and, and at least get the, the dialogue started. So, you know, we, we have the, the bridge funding uh, to finish the bridge. There were questions about the landings on each side of the bridge. Uh, that, that got heated to the point that I think that overall funding of the project was in jeopardy. And so DOT wisely said uh, there's so much debate about the, the landings on each side of the bridge, the Gulf Breeze and Pensacola side, that uh, we'll separate the questions. So we'll, we'll plan, design, build the bridge, and then we'll deal with the, the landings on each side as separate issues. We had a meeting in Escambia County a couple nights ago uh, for the, the Pensacola landing side. And so uh, I think, so to answer the viewers' questions, Absolutely. I mean, that, that's, you know, the engineers at, at DOT and, and the contractors that are working on this, that absolutely plays into their thought process. Uh, you know, to, you're obviously going to have a bottleneck if you don't address it. And so uh, it's a positive that they've decided to look at those as separate projects. And uh, so ho hopefully that will address the viewer's concern. No, and there's no doubt, Jeff, that that bridge needs to be replaced. Department of Transportation is telling us that it is becoming cost prohibitive, keeping it repaired, keeping it in a position where traffic can flow over it. And so what we don't want to do is to delay the implementation of having that new bridge built. So we must move forward with that. If there's anything that's going to delay that, because if you introduce something new into the project at this time, it would have to go through the entire process again and could delay it by years. That is something we cannot afford. We must instead have these workaround solutions, as Representative Ingram was saying, as we pr uh, press forward on replacing that bridge. Okay, very good. You are watching and or listening to uh, dialogue with the delegation, legislative review on WSRE television, and we're being simulcast on News Radio 1620. If you have a question, you can email us at questions at WSRE.org or call us at 850-484-1223 or 1-800-239-WSRE. Lots of viewer questions this evening. We greatly appreciate those. Here's another one sort of regarding the alimony bill that we talked about earlier. Why was child custody 50-50 tacked onto the alimony reform bill? Well, there were a number of legislators who believed that the starting point for an analysis of child custody ought to not have uh, a gender element. It simply ought to be that let's start with the notion that a child's best if both parents are in their life at an equal share. Now that doesn't mean that through the production of evidence and the presentation of evidence before a court that that would change. That's simply what the baseline would be. And I think there's some question into law now as to what that baseline would be. So that was a provision that was added in the Florida Senate that the House accepted. Okay. Here's a question we'll probably be talking about an awful lot in years to come as our population continues to age. Uh, the viewer wants to know how can we assist the autistic and mentally retarded senior citizen population, especially when their caregivers are elderly themselves. So we just have an aging population. And well, this is the number one question that I am asked by the parents of children with developmental disabilities. You see, because of the proliferation of healthcare technology, we're able to keep developmentally disabled people alive longer, but then that creates a consequence when their caregivers pass away. So this is the issue that keeps parents up at night. One of the things that we've done in the legislature is really uh, put a lot of investment into making sure that developmentally disabled Floridians have career opportunities and that those career opportunities might be at a grocery store, might be at a hardware store, but that then that creates more self-sufficiency. And we've learned this, if we put in enough money on the front end for speech therapy, behavioral therapy, then we actually get to the point later on in life where we transition people from being tax burdens to being taxpayers. In the final hours of legislative session, uh, our legislature stepped forward and provided tens of millions of dollars in additional funding up front for children with Down syndrome. 
because we've seen research that indicates that if we make that investment, we really move the needle in people's lives. Absolutely, and Jeff, I'm so proud of this delegation here that they supported uh, the funding of organizations that take care of those who have developmental disabilities, such as Art Gateway, who does a great job, United Cerebral Palsy. So we were able to increase the funding for those organizations, and we also made sure that those with de developmental disabilities were receiving the proper funding for their education, that they could choose outside the normal education system to be able to make sure that they are receiving a proper education, which then will allow them to be properly employed later on. Okay. Well, speaking of that, we have another question regarding autism, and the question from the viewer is, why have funds been cut for autism? They haven't. They have uh, not. They've, been, they've been increased, and particularly, as Representative Hill said, in our community, there are millions of dollars in recurring funds that come right here to Pensacola to care for those that are uh, dealing with autism. Okay. Uh, economic development question here. Uh, viewer says a number of economic development projects in Northwest Florida were vetoed in last year's budget that were approved this year uh, by uh, and, and apparently will be signed by the governor. Why were these projects approved this year? I, I think a lot of it, Jeff, had to do with uh, uh, obviously the governor had a, a goal last year of vetoing a certain amount of projects. Uh, there was probably you know politics at play with the, the senators involved in, uh, as well, so uh, that, that played into it. Another thing this year, we were able to uh, do the uh, work up front, sell the ideas to the governor, the Bluffs project specifically. The other thing was getting the uh, funding source right. I think that that made a big difference with regard to the Bluffs project specifically, the Muskogee Road expansion and the, uh, the I-10 uh, uh, project. Um, I, I think the airport project as well, getting the funding source right, making sure that uh, uh, you know, the, the road fund was used for the uh, airport project. And uh, I, th I think that made the governor, gave him a certain level of comfortability with it. I think also the, the governor saw the strong will of both the House and the Senate. The budget was a bipartisan vote. 159 folks voted for, one voted against, who happened to be a Republican from South Florida. So we sent a clear message to the governor that we were, we were convinced that we had a good budget, and I think he got that message, and hope, hopefully he'll hold back on his uh, veto pen a little more this year. Okay. Very good. Um, viewer question uh, begins with a comment. I would like to see the delegation introduce and work for passage of a resolution to Congress proposing a law that only permits single legislation as Florida requires. This would avoid all of the pile-on legislation that gets passed. Any comment? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. We have a single subject requirement in the state constitution and if you've got a bill that's like one of these federal omnibus bills that spans a variety of issues or a variety of sectors of issues, then that's unconstitutional and doesn't have the force of law. And uh, it's a form of log rolling that happens in Washington where they create these politician-generated crises and then they pass one big bill that deals with everything and it's just an up or down proposition. I think our founders would be rolling over in their graves if they watched what was happening in Washington right now in that respect. And absolutely, I think everyone here uh, would be supportive of a memorial from the Florida House of Representatives saying that if it's good enough for Florida to focus on a single subject at a single time so that people could see where we are, it ought to be good enough for Washington too. Absolutely, and Jeff, what, as Representative uh, uh, Gates was saying, it works in Florida to have a single subject issue when you are dealing with legislation. So each of our different states are supposed to be like an experimental lab to see what works. We've proven that it works in Florida it should work in Washington, D.C. also. The thing is, when we pass these resolutions or these memorials and send them up to Washington, D.C., uh, sometimes they don't carry a lot of weight behind them, um, depending on who the administration is that's in play there. Uh, but we can still make that statement that that is what we do, it works, and it should work in Washington, D.C. also. Jeff, I had a bill that uh, went through every committee, went to the floor, had come back from the Senate that had so many amendments attached to it that I could not accept it. And I actually killed my own bill. And that's the power of each member, that if, when it's their bill, they can, at the end of the day, say, I, I choose not to continue to promote that bill. Okay, very good. Some good commentary there. Um, I have sold and purchased real estate this year, the viewer says, and I would like to see the documentary stamps, called doc stamps, taxes I paid go to funding the purchase of sensitive lands through the Florida Forever program. 
Which one of you will support the purchase of projects in our area, which are the remaining parcels in Lower Perdido River buffer and the Clear Creek slash Whiting Field buffer? Well, first, I want to thank the viewer for their real estate tra transaction in the state of Florida. The fact that we've had so many real estate tra transactions has largely contributed to our state surplus, and it's one of the reasons why we're able to enhance care for the vulnerable, like we were discussing earlier in the program. We've bought a lot of environmentally sensitive land as a state. The challenge then is you have to maintain it. And so with the portion of documentary stamp, doc stamps that are dedicated for environmental purposes, we've chosen in hit instead to prioritize infrastructure. It doesn't do you much good to go buy a, a basin, a, a river basin, if then there's pollution that is going into that purchased area as a result of bad piping or bad infrastructure or stormwater runoff. And so we've seen in our own communities, you know, in the community I serve in Fort Walton Beach and in uh, Niceville and in Valparaiso, money was in the state budget to make sure that we restored the infrastructure that's not only above ground but below ground. And ultimately, that's going to have a better impact on our, our environment when our stormwater isn't polluting our bays and our rivers and our bayous. And, you know, around in, Escambia County has around a million dollars from the state to uh, use as abatement or buffer lands around our uh, military installations and they work with uh, the Nature Conservancy and also the Department of the Interior to to purchase those buffer lands and then also to do it in a smart way where the parcels are contiguous and actually uh, do what they're intended to do and not uh, be, be piecemeal uh, and not actually provide a buffer so uh, if that's the uh, you know concern of the, of the viewer that that's something that is being done. And, and to add to that Jeff um, according to our constitutional amendment which was passed a couple of years ago a third of all doc stamps um, must go towards uh, protecting our, our environment. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that by purchasing more land that we are protecting that environment, as Representative uh, Gates said. Already, almost a third of the land in Florida is owned by the government, either state or federal. So we need to better manage what we currently own instead of purchasing more. Okay. Um, viewer says there are 389 convicts on death row, some for as long as 40 years. Viewer says, why, why, why should we bear this cost? It's a great question. It's a question I asked when I was chairman of the Criminal Justice Subcommittee. Jeff, we learned there are cases where people were on death row for 25, 30 years, where guilt or innocence was not in question. They were just on their seventh appeal on whether or not their lawyer hired the right psychiatrist to evaluate their troubled childhood. And so we passed the Timely Justice Act. I was the sponsor. All of my colleagues here supported it. And it said that if you have an appeal that is not based on guilt or innocence or new evidence, but just some procedural challenge regarding the assistance of your lawyer, that you got one shot at that and that that couldn't be something that repeats over and over again. After my law went into effect, the rate of executions in this state went up threefold. Now, recently, the United States Supreme Court uh, threw a little wrench into the system when they called into question how many jurors and whether or not it was the jurors or the judge that would ultimately sentence someone uh, to death. And we made changes this year that I think will get us back on track and that will make sure that we have a death penalty system that is more efficient, more effective, and a better deterrent to violent crime. Okay. Viewer question here, how can you make efforts to bring investment, business, and jobs to Florida? Uh, that's the easy one, Jeff. What you do is you get government out of the way. You reduce taxes on, on businesses that come into the state, and you also make sure that the regulations are not so onerous. As Representative Gates said, um, over the past number of years, more than 4,000 unnecessary regulations have been removed, which creates that environment for businesses who want to move here. We need to do more. There are more regulations we need to get out of the way. We need to make sure that the, uh, it's not so onerous on those who want to get licensing to come into the state, that we're not just creating a barrier for those who are already in business, um, preventing those who want to start in that business because of the extent that they have to do in terms of licensing, education requirements, and so forth. The more we can get government out of the way, the more that we let business prosper, the better the whole state will be. And here's the good news, Jeff. We've done it. I think Representative Gates and I both served on the Select Committee on Government Reorganization, which was my freshman uh, session. I think Representative Gates had been here a, a little longer. But, uh, you know, the first thing we did was, was get into, you know, seriously cutting regulation, 
taxes, streamlining the uh, state's economic development uh, apparatus, actually eliminated an, a government agency, which is one of the greatest feelings you can imagine. We eliminated the Department of Community Affairs, and uh, that was a huge hindrance to, to business. The fruit of that, and, and what Representative Hill laid out, is that uh, you know here just in Escambia County, we've created 8,000 jobs uh, since uh, you know 2010. Uh, at an average salary of $53,000. That's phenomenal. And it's because of the hard uh, work we did, the, the tough choices we made to cut taxes and regulation in 2010. Jeff, okay. I think also that one of the real disappointments that we had as a delegation when we found out late in session that the money that will be coming from BP, the billion five that will be spread out over 18 years, will go through the general fund. And I don't believe many of our colleagues from South Florida understand the pressure that we're under because of Alabama and Georgia. They're willing to uh, incentivize people to come to their state. And now we're not going to be in that same position. So it is a disappointment. Hopefully we can work on uh, convincing our colleagues that that money needs to be spent in the eight affected counties and not spread out over the other counties throughout Florida. But we were all very disappointed that that money does not go directly into Triumph so that we could distribute it to the people that would create more jobs and opportunity. How optimistic are you guys that you will be able to make that change and get more of it here in Northwest Florida? Well, Jeff, I can only go by what our current speaker or incoming speaker, Richard Corcoran, has stated, and he's put it in writing. He said that according to Florida statute, any money that comes into Florida must first go into the Treasury and the, uh, then be appropriated by the legislature. And he says that's the process we have to go by because of the Florida Constitution. And he said in his letter, I commit to you that that funding for that source would be coming to the eight affected counties because we were the ones who were affected by it the most. So I can only go by his word and hopefully uh, it, if the money comes after he's no longer speaker, that the following speaker on that will also honor that. Okay. Move on to another viewer question. In-state tuition for illegal immigrants, who pays for it? Why is it permitted? Well, it's permitted because despite the fact that every member of our delegation voted no, every Democrat and a majority of Republicans voted to give in-state tuition to illegal aliens. And in doing so, the state of Florida cost ourselves more money and already illegal immigration costs our country $117 billion a year. And more importantly, we eroded rule of law. We said that we're going to incent and become a magnet for uh, illegal immigration. So the taxpayers of Florida will pay for it. We did everything we could to stop it. But frankly, uh, more liberal Republicans and Democrats turned their back on rule of law, turned their back on Floridians, and instead chose to politically pander to illegal aliens. Okay. We're getting close on time here. Uh, voter identification, uh, and this is, uh, was actually uh, was a question for Senator Gates, who was unable to be with us this evening. He is uh, under the weather. But uh, do you support photo ID voter registration to validate eligible U.S. citizenry? Absolutely, Jeff. And we have that in Florida now. Just recently, we had the uh, election for uh, here in Florida to see who we wanted to be for our nominee. And... I went and voted at my precinct. They asked for uh, your I identification and verified it before you were allowed to vote. So we have uh, voter ID here in Florida. I think the rest of the nation needs to pick that up if they don't have it. And we as Floridians need to continue to push back against this movement that says you do not need identification in order to vote. Okay. Another viewer question here, uh, and I'm not sure you guys actually would have an answer for this, but uh, it, it nonetheless will be fun to talk about. Why shouldn't the new Bay Bridge be two levels? <laughs> I don't know. Well, again, happening. we're past the design phase of that bridge, and to make any changes to it now would delay it. It would cost too much money to continue making repairs to the current bridge, so we just have to continue with what we have now. Okay, very good. Here's one on fracking. Fracking has been known to destroy towns, groundwater, promote earthquakes, and our limestone uh, geology is fragile. I am understanding a law was trying to be passed that would take away the county's right to oppose this type of drilling. Are you supportive of fracking? Have you done the best to learn the dangers uh, this imposes on our environment? For three years, it's been before our committee, and we have massive uh, testimony 
on the effect of fracking. Florida is not a particularly great state to frack, but I would suggest that people go on Netflix and look at Flack Nation and uh, see what it says about what it does. Some of the information is misinformation, and the fact is that most of the drilling in Florida is at 12 to 14,000 feet, and our water base is around 2,000 feet. So it's not really an issue that is based on reality and truth, and I would suggest that these people do a lot more research and not listen to the first things that people say that may or may not be true. I have about three minutes left, so I want to give each one of you about 30 seconds or so just for a few closing remarks. Well, uh, it's truly been a privilege uh, to serve in the Northwest Florida delegation, and I'm proud that we stand for the constitutional principles that have made America great and that continue to make Florida great. Low taxes, limited regulation, following the Constitution, we're proving here in Florida that it works and we can lead the country. When we came in the office in 2010, things were bleak. We were $6 billion in the hole, and we made some tough decisions. Now we've had surplus for the last three years, unlike many of the states that we deal with up north that did not make those hard decisions. And I think that if you find that people make good decisions in hard times, they'll make good decisions in good times. And fortunately, Florida is going through a very uh, favorable time where we're seeing people move here, want to live and play, and call Florida their home. I'm proud to be a Floridian. Representative Hill. Uh, Jeff, I'm proud of this legislati legislative delegation. They've done a tremendous job. They've made Florida uh, the destination state, and it's because we provide good public policy for the most part. And, and that's, is it constitutional? Is it fiscally responsible? Will it fix a problem, and is it morally sound? Using that as a framework, we have created a, an environment where people want to come to Florida to live, to pray, and to raise their families. Representative Ingram. Thanks, Jeff. And I think I got a little nostalgic when you said in the intro, this might be our last time all here right. together. So I just want to let everyone know it's, it's a, uh, beyond an honor to, to uh, take Northwest Florida values to Tallahassee and represent the people of, of Northwest Florida in the legislature. And I want to thank everyone for giving me the chance to do that. And uh, thank you for having us on tonight. Well, it's been our pleasure. Um, and I, I, I also want to say we're uh, sad that uh, Senator Gates uh, could not be here tonight. He uh, obviously very successful career in the Florida legislature and served uh, several years as uh, Florida's Senate president. A little bit under the weather uh, this evening and uh, was unable to make it. And of course, uh, he will uh, not be a part of the delegation anymore because of uh, the term limits. So uh, anyway, we wish him the very best in his future endeavors. Uh, also, uh, Senator Evers was unable to make it this evening as well. He was out of town. And uh, gentlemen, I just want to say, as, as I mentioned in the beginning of the show, it's probably the last time we'll be together as this particular delegation. Uh, it was a pleasure to get to know each and every one of you, and we greatly appreciate you taking your time and, and coming in and uh, providing the information to uh, our reviewers and constituents, and I wish you the very best of luck as you move forward. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. You bet. We certainly appreciate uh, these gentlemen joining us this evening, and we wish them all the very best in their future endeavors. By the way, a very special thanks to you, our viewers, listeners, and constituents of Northwest Florida. We appreciate all of your questions. Our guests this evening have been members of the local Northwest Florida legislative delegation. Representatives Clay Ingram, Mike Hill, Doug Broxson, and Matt Gates. Senators Don Gates and Greg Evers were unable to join us. As you know, this is an election year, and like in years past, WSRE will host rally programs which will provide viewers with an unbiased look at candidates across a variety of races. There will be three rally programs before the primary election. They will take place in early August. The general election rally programs will air on WSRE television in late October. Rally is produced as a public service in cooperation with the League of Women Voters. Tonight's broadcast has come to you from the Phyllis and Mike Johnson studio over the television airwaves of WSRE TV, PBS for the Gulf Coast. And we're also heard on News Radio 1620. I'm Jeff Weeks. Have a nice evening and enjoy your spring and summer in the sunshine state of Florida. Good night, everyone.